Okay, welcome. This is the first of a long series. Of, I'm Brian Chen, Chief Science Officer of Foxer Technologies. With me today are Drs. Frank Poon and Alex Zavarankov. They've recently published a paper titled Hallmarks of Aging Based Dual Purpose Disease and Age Associated Targets Predicted Using Pandaomics, which they'll tell us about, which is an AI powered discovery engine. So before we get into the details, uh, why don't uh, uh, Alex and Frank give you guys give us a brief introduction about yourself and your backgrounds. Uh, maybe we start with Alex. Sure. Hi, happy to be uh, here. Uh, my name is Alex Shavankov. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Silicon Medicine. Uh, I'm also the uh, founder and now uh, independent uh, consultant, chief longevity officer of a company called Deep Longevity. Uh, my background is in computer science. Uh, I did my first two degrees at Queen's University in Canada, uh, so I'm Canadian, and um, uh, then had uh, really a really fun career in information technology, primarily in semiconductors and GPUs that are now powering deep neural networks. And uh, in early 2000s, uh, I decided that I wanted to switch from uh, um, IT into biotechnology and uh, dedicate the rest of my life to the study of aging. Did my grad work at Johns Hopkins University, did my grad work at MSU, and then uh, worked for a number of companies in the field. Uh, had my own lab at the Cancer Center, Regenerative Medicine Lab and Bioinformatics Lab. And then uh, in 2013-2014, started in Silicon Medicine. Originally went back to Baltimore to the campus of the Johns Hopkins University uh, Emerging Technology Centers. Started the company there, but it was already very truly global from scratch. So now most of what I do is manage a very global team distributed over uh, eight countries and regions. We have uh, six physical R&D centers and we have uh, over 200 uh, employees and over 200 FTEs. So now my background shifted more into AI powered drug discovery. And pretty much uh, everything I do is outlined here on those stages. So we uh, we do target ID and validation, hit ID, lead ID, uh, lead opt, uh, um, IND enabling studies. Uh, we are now in clinic with the first AI discovered and AI designed uh, molecules. Uh, so my background is kind of transforming and transitioning more into pharma and AI powered biotech. Great. Um, I'll just make note that I also spent some time in Baltimore and your legend was already growing by uh, that time, uh, maybe over six years ago now. So you've built quite the uh, establishments here. So great to have Thank you here. You. Um, so you're uh, accompanied by Dr. Frank Poon, also at In Silico Medicine. So Frank, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. Um, well, I'm currently uh, leading a team of application scientists uh, focusing on our target discovery platform, Pandomics. So uh, my goal is to, with the latest AI technologies, to help the medical scientists to find the best therapeutic targets. Um, with all of my background, I got a PhD in biochemistry. In, and then upon my graduations, I was working as a visiting scholar and leading a team of a scientist uh, focusing on the research on some neuro uh, uh, um, diseases studies and um, cancers. Okay, and um, before I uh, joined in state calls, I was a uh, server as a CEO of a biotech company in Hong Kong, known as the Pharmacogenetics Limited, uh, focusing on some diagnostic products developments as well as the sequencing. Okay, I joined in state code in 2020. Um, it is a very uh, good. Uh, opportunity for me to explore the latest advances in technologies in the circles. Um, um, actually, I also got an MBA from the Rutgers Business School in the United States. And um, yeah, so uh, currently I'm in addition to uh, leading the applications team on the target discovery, I'm also responsible for lots of uh, project collaborations uh, in both academia as well as the pharma. That's my main background. Thank you very much. And I'm really happy to have the opportunities to introduce our platform as well as our agent paper today. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Well, great to have you here. 
Um, just because our audience at aging is very broad. So we have laboratory scientists and we have computational folks. You guys are certainly on the extreme end of the computational side, but you have a lot of biology in your paper. So uh, you, you span both. Can, you, can one of you give a brief intro for those who have never heard of AI, uh, what it is and why one might use it? And then let's talk about panda omics and what that specific, specifically does. So yeah, uh, that that this this is a very interesting question. Uh, there are multiple different definitions of artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, uh, different scientists define it differently. So for me, uh, the way I uh, look at artificial intelligence uh, is I associate it with uh, deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. Uh, it's a form of uh, uh, machine learning which. Uh, um, uh, mimics the human brain. So you've got multiple layers of uh, interconnected neurons uh, that uh, change the, their connections and their uh, different properties with the exposure to data uh, in a very uh, uh, different settings uh, with different algorithmic approaches. Uh, so those deep neural networks, uh, there are multiple flavors of uh, deep learning. There is deep reinforcement learning, where you combine uh, uh, prediction, recognition, generation with strategy. So now uh, deep neural networks can learn strategy. Uh, and uh, those combinations allow you to outperform humans in uh, uh, strategy-associated uh, problems like uh, Go, games of Go, Atari, uh, and many other tasks, uh, including tasks where the strategy is not very clear. Uh, and I'll just share uh, my, my screen very briefly. So, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Here on this uh, slide, you can see the history of uh, um, deep learning. So some of the very early concepts were proposed by Alan Turing and many other brilliant minds uh, at the dawn of the 20th century. So the, uh, uh, many of the technologies had to be developed and converge before 2013, 2014, when there was a real explosion of uh, AI, when uh, deep neural networks started outperforming humans. And the reason why AI became so popular, trendy around the time is because three things happened. First, the algorithms uh, uh, became better and caught up with, with the availability of data. So now those deep neural networks could be, now, could be trained on massive data sets that became available. Of course, uh, that's the other big, big thing that allowed the deep neural networks to start up from humans. And third is GPU computing. So the availability of highly parallel, high-performance computing, uh, graphics processing units, those are semiconductors that uh, can perform many parallel operations at the same time and are used to power video games. They, the performance there has improved to the level where, again, deep neural networks could be trained very uh, efficiently, very quickly on large amounts of data. And those deep neural networks started outperforming humans. Then there were several innovations that transformed uh, the industry. So one is generative adversarial networks. That's a form of uh, AI imagination, so GANs. Those are two deep neural networks competing against each other. One is uh, learning to generate meaningful noise with the uh, desired properties. Uh, and another um, deep neural network is trying to recognize whether the output of uh, this first deep neural network is true or false. And those two deep neural networks compete with each other over uh, millions or billions of iterations. Uh, they get so good at uh, generation of uh, fake data with the desired properties that it's indistinguishable from uh, reality. So now you can generate really efficient, uh, really beautiful faces of humans, uh, really great works of art. Uh, you can now generate molecules. Uh, you can generate human biological data can actually, so we use it a lot for uh, generation of uh, virtual populations. So now you can take, imagine one human uh, with, the, with, 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 with all the properties, imagine that you take Brad Pitt and you want to make that Brad Pitt uh, older, let's say 80 year old, uh, female, Asian uh, and different skin color. So those are just huge generation conditions. You can tweak them 
and get the entire distribution. You can get hundreds of thousands of breath pits with, uh, where those four conditions are satisfied. Uh, and you can do this on biological data, on, on data that is not, are not pictures. Uh, you can age humans, including into the future. There is also great technology called reinforcement learning, which basically works on uh, reward and punishment concept. If uh, the system produces uh, the results you want and identifies the strategy, it gets uh, rewarded. If it doesn't, it gets punished. And there are many appro approaches to this, to, to this concept, but now those systems are outperforming humans in strategy games, including Atari and uh, even like extremely complex uh, ones like StarCraft and the company called DeepMind truly pioneered that, that technology it can also be combined with GANs. So think about those many technologies as Lego blocks that you can build uh, very sophisticated AI systems. Uh, uh, and finally, another uh, really important technology that just emerged are transformer neural networks. These ne networks are predominantly used on uh, text data, but many other data types uh, can be used on transformers. And transformers allow you to get very important insights from data. So for example, you've probably heard about GPT-3. This is a form of conversational AI. So you can even create uh, very efficient chatbots that will mimic human behavior and human responses, providing very efficient kind of jeopardy type answers. So here on this diagram, you can also see the timeline for generative adversarial networks. Here are just general purpose GANs that can generate, uh, again, those deep fakes. And here are the GANs for chemistry. And to my knowledge, the first paper on GANs for chemistry in a peer reviewed journal was our group uh, paper. Uh, cornucopia of meaningful leads. So there we, for the first time, showed that we can use the adversarial autoencoder to generate molecules with the desired properties and then validate it by using matching to the known chemical space. And then you can see that there are theoretical papers that our group published, different approaches, different uh, generative adversarial network ar architectures applied to different chemical problems. Then in 2017, we did our first experimental validation of a newly generated small molecule with the desired properties, validated, tested, published, and we got our first round of investment, our first Series A investment. And then we also did the another famous paper where we generated small molecules with the desired properties in a very short amount of time, synthesized and tested. And that is a pretty famous paper. So that's what AI can do for you in chemistry. And today we're going to talk about what AI can do for biology, because when you are thinking about drug discovery, you need to think end to end. And there you need to have multiple forms of AI applied to different types of problems. So actually, if you like, I can very quickly show you how it looks like from the integration perspective. So if you want to apply AI in drug discovery, you need to look at the many steps of drug discovery and development. Look at how you can uh, automate and accelerate and improve every single step and then connect those steps with AI. And you would be using very different types of AI for every one of those steps. So think of it as a brain, right? So you've got uh, pieces of the brain that are responsible for vestibular apparatus. So you do not fall. You have memory. You have uh, uh, higher cognitive functions. You dream. Uh, you strategize. So those are different parts of your brain, right? Very seamlessly integrated. So here we are trying to build the AI pharma brain. And for that, you need to have AI for, AI for clinical data analysis. You need to have AI for competitive landscape analysis, for transcriptomic and proteomic data analysis. That's what we're going to talk about today. Drug effects research, structural biology, but many areas of drug discovery cannot be significantly accelerated by AI because you need to do the experiments. You need to do the physical work. So. That's going to be uh, AI for drug discovery the way I see it. And what we have done, we have integrated many of those steps. Great. And just to set the stage for us, panda omics and then what you just showed us, how are they related? Sure. Again, the picture is worth a thousand words. So panda omics is the first step. It's the step where we identify targets. We do uh, biological data analysis and identify targets for 
a variety of diseases. Let me uh, just show you one slide. So Panda Omics is a tool that stands in the very beginning of the drug discovery process. So you can use multiple different data types, predominantly transcriptomics, proteomics, methylation, uh, and text uh, in order to identify targets that are at the same time novel and have high confidence of working in a specific disease or in a specific biological process like aging. So here you've got 60,000 possible targets or more, uh, more than 10,000 diseases and what we are trying to do is match the target to a disease. So if you, you would be able to modulate the disease or a biological process. Chemistry 42 system allows you to very efficiently generate small molecules to achieve that goal, to basically be able to manipulate those proteins with chemistry. And then clinical predicts the outcomes of clinical trials and improves uh, your ability to design clinical trials. So if you look at it from, from broad perspective, Frank is going to talk about that. We start from uh, target discovery usually, right? And that process is more of an art than science. So it's art and science, because uh, at the uh, end of the day, you will have a very large list of promising targets with the desired properties, and you would need to rank those targets because you don't have an unlimited budget. And very often you just need to select one. So one of the highlights of uh, what we do uh, at Ancilico was our exercise that we started in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, where we decided to go after a novel target, novel molecule, generate using AI, and take it all the way into clinic. So right now, that particular target is in the clinic. It's a very improbable event. Usually the probability of that happening is very tiny. It's less than a percent because most of the targets fail at the early preclinical stage. But in our case, we managed to succeed. And that is due to the system that we're going to show you. So we tried to do the same thing for aging and age-associated diseases in, in, in this paper. Frank, so now we could get into your paper, which, as Alex just set us up for, is focused on aging and age-related diseases. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, but before that, maybe I can give more background of our pandemic platform. Okay, let me share my screen now. Good. <clears throat> okay, so um, as Alice mentioned, uh, Pandomics is the first step of our fully integrated drug discovery platform. It mainly focus on the target discovery as well as some omic analysis. For case, um, previously we have demonstrated a very successful story. That is, we use our Pandomics to identify a novel targets and then um, use Chemistry 42 to uh, find that the design of molecules and then went through a series of uh, in vitro and in vivo studies and reached the IND enabling in less than 18 months. And now we already reached the phase one stage. Okay, so um, basically uh, AI can shorten the time at the early stage of the target discovery as well as the lead optimizations. So from this AI can speed up the drug discovery and development significantly. Uh, let's focus on pandemics. Uh, as I mentioned, it is an end-to-end -end omic analysis as well as uh, the target discovery platform. So in our back end, uh, we have a huge resources. For example, we have over uh, 10 million samples from different types of the data sets, including but not limited to microarray, RNA-seq, methylomics, and proteomics, and the single cell data. And then for the tax data, um, we covered not only the publications, but also the grants, patents, and clinical trials, as well as uh, many financial reports. So here is the overall workflow of our pandemics. Basically, we can start with any uh, in our platform, or we can upload our proprietary data set into the platforms to do the analysis. And then we can start with the standard gene differential expression analysis, pathway analysis. And then based on these, we can find out the genes that is highly associated with uh, the disease. And then with a lot of the drugability filters, and then we can find the targets we want. So this is the basic idea. So in terms of the, we have developed our proprietary tools known as the iPanda algorithms. And actually in 2016, we already published a paper in Nature Communications that demonstrated our pathway analysis 
outperforming all other pathway analysis tools. And over the years, we have published many papers with these iPanda tools. And in Pandomics, we already incorporated with the latest version of this iPanda pathway analysis. So here is the overview of uh, our target identification philosophy. So in Pandomics, uh, we incorporated a lot of the omics AI scores, text-based AI scores, KOL scores, and financial scores. So all, all together, we have over uh, 20 AI and bioinformatics models where we used to render target disease associations. And then we also use the time machine approach to evaluate the abilities of our algorithms to find the novel targets. And then after that, we have a series of druggability filters, for example, to further narrow down the druggable class we are interested in, and then also assess the druggability of the targets, whether they can be accessible by the small molecules or proteins, the target safety, and the target novelty, which is very important to the researchers. And then we also provide the filters for different developmental level, yes, um, so that uh, different users can, so this is our main philosophy. So um, I guess I many people now we ask, so where is the AI components of the pandemics? So um, basically AI is used to identify the genes, diseases, compounds, for those biological process and the association in the text with our NLP. Okay, the most important is AI uh, driven graph based model is used for ranking the targets. Yes, which I will uh, give more detail in the next slide for the target identification. And lastly, but also very important, that is AI is also used to capture the trends to analyze the potential for the initiation of phase one. So as I mentioned, we have over 60 models to help us to run the target disease associations. And we finally only selected about 20 models into our platform uh, to do that. So I would like to take uh, the Interatom community as an example here. For example, we will collect the uh, all mixed information, text, data of our genes, and then put them together with the disease information into a single bipartite graph. Okay, and then we will see how well the genes is being connected with that particular disease. And then we will do the target disease pair embedding, and then we use a multi-layer perceptions decoder to get a prediction score for how well that gene is being connected with the disease. So it is only one of the model to help us to predict targets and disease association, okay? And then all these over 60 models, we will try to validate where our model can really help us to predict the good targets. Then we use a time machine validation approach here. For example, we take 2010 as an ex uh, example here as a cut off time. And then our system, we try to collect all the data between before 2010 and use our model to predict the targets coming out into the clinical phase in the next several years. Okay, for example, let's say uh, if the model can predict 19 out of 20 targets that will be coming into the clinical trial in the next several years, it means that the model performs very well, but let's say it uh, only one or two, okay, in that case, we will further to improve our algorithms or we simply ignore that model. So this is the uh, time machine validation approach. In that case, over 60 models, we have or we will have their validation matrix. The x-axis shows the level change enrichments of how well the target predictions that model can do. And then the y-axis uh, shows the, whether that uh, target prediction enrichment is statistically significant, yes. So here, we can just clearly see that score two has a higher predictive target predictive power than score one. In that case, we will only choose score two as the models to help us to predict on targets in our platform. So this is our validation approach. So basically, I think a pandemic's unique advantage over the other the tools in the market is that we have a huge database that is curated specifically for the target discovery. Yes, and we have a very comprehensive source of data. Okay, it is not only limited to omics, but also the tags data as well. And also we have a very unique and um, time machine validation approach. 
because we all know that we cannot predict the future, but with the backtesting, we can still prove the abilities of our models to generate the truly local target hypothesis. Okay. And other point that I would like to highlight is that most of the AI and statistic models, they calculate the target ID scores in real time. So it is actually a dynamic calculations of the target ID. The, 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 the target ID scores will vary depending on the inputs of the data sets the users add into our platform. So it is not just an, an encyclopedia or just a database telling you what target is associated with what disease. Okay, but really based on the input data of the user in, into our platform. As we know that in circles, we have one of our main focus in, on aging. And in previous year, we published many paper on that. For example, of our markers of aging, some aging clock, as well as some uh, different, for example, uh, one of the latest paper is the increased pace of aging in, in COVID-related mortality, something like that. So in that case, uh, currently we use these great platforms to help us to find some dual purpose targets. I would like to explain why <clears throat> do we need to find the dual purpose targets? Because uh, nowadays, most of us agree that uh, aging is one of the very important driving force for many types of disease. So in that case, let's say if we have a dual purpose targets that is uh, implicated in both age associated diseases and the aging, so even the target itself that cannot be very, uh, very helpful for specific disease indications, but the people, the patients can still uh, be at benef benefits from the targets of, of itself. So it is known as the off-target effect. So it is very important. That's why we conduct this study. Okay, here is the main workflow of our uh, present study. So basically we try to identify a series of age-associated diseases and then many non-age associated diseases. And then we gather the corresponding transcriptomics data and some proteomics data in the pandemics. And then we do the target identifications. Here is the target identifications. I can show more details with our platforms to how we can do that. And then we can find age associated targets here. And there are some age and non-age associated targets here. So the overlapping we will count it as the common target. And then we will do the hallmark of aging assessments to make sure the target we select will be involved in aging-related pathway or some MOA. And then after that, we will identify the age-associated target and the common targets. And then next, we go through a series of criteria, for example, whether those targets are being consistently dysregulated in a couple of disease, that is very important, yes, and also their MOA in aging, and also the target's safety, to, you know, because some target may be very good, but if it is not safe to use it, and then we will not propose that, okay, and finally we select some potential target for this dual purpose. Okay, in terms of how much of aging, we have basically collected 12 main mechanisms, for example, some of them, some of them are the um, most important ones, and such as the information, okay, and also the telomere attrition. We have to note that the extracellular matrix stiffness is also very important, and it is one of the important hallmarks of aging proposed recently. And our paper also demonstrated it is very, very important it's because I guess over um, 30 of our target selected belong to this family. So. Okay, in terms of disease, we selected 19 non age associated disease and 14 age associated disease. Okay, main criteria is that let's say if the, on, if the onset age is highly related to the particular indications, we will classify that as an age associated disease. But here we we'll simply exclude, let's say, the cancer and some cardiovascular disease for this study. Because we think that, especially for the cancer, some of the mechanisms of the hormone of aging in the cancers and the age-associated disease are in the opposite directions. So in that case, we simply exclude the cancer here for the present study. And then we have uh, lots of the prioritizations and the droppability filters in our platform. I think here maybe I can switch to our platforms to better give you the idea uh, how we can do that. Okay, and let me show you another one. Okay, okay. So 
I hope you can see my screen now as well. Okay. Uh, so here is the our pandemic platform. So basically now I'm showing the target identif identification results of one of the age associated disease. This is ALS, uh, which is also one of our next focus. Most likely we will publish another paper on this ALS as well. So here we can see that there are over 20 omics and text-based models uh, for or the target discovery. Okay, so this is overall ranking. Show us some of the potential targets for this ARS. And now here shows the uh, 13 omics model here. Okay, so each of them has passed through the time machine validation approach and show that they perform very well in terms of target identifications. That's why we include them here. So what I want to highlight here is that uh, these uh, omics scores models, they are based on the real time calculations, depends on the, uh, the data set in, in, we input into the system. On the other hand, the text-based scores, they are pre-calculated, they are relatively static. Yes, um, okay. So by default, uh, let's say when we find high confidence targets, we can turn on all these omics score model as well as the text-based model so that we can find the targets that have a strong performance in terms of the omics model as well have a strong backup from the literature. Okay, that's what we do. At the same time, let's say if we find high confidence target, then we, we can make sure the target has already has been associated with some small molecules and it is relatively safe to use. And then we make sure the target belongs to a druggable family. Okay, so that is how we find the high confidence targets. So next, let's say if we want to find some novel target or some medium novel targets, how we can do that? Okay, this is very simple. For example, in that case, we can relax the small market requirement. In that case, we can find a target and that uh, currency do not have a small market associated with them uh, entered in the clin clinical phase, but they still belong to a druggable class. That is very important because we don't want to find something that is, that is that belong to a non-druggable class, but then it becomes very useful for us. And then we can turn on the novelty filters uh, to make sure they are relative new, and then still turn on the druggability filters but now, because we want to find some novel target, we do not rely on the literature support. So now we can only use the omics models to find the targets. Okay. So in that case, and the system will based on our new criteria and then to propose a list of feasible, uh, sorry, feasible targets. Okay. And for, uh, for example, here, uh, these targets, they are, uh, very new to this particular disease. Okay, as we can see, we didn't get any literature support from the text database. But why did the system select them? Because these targets still perform very well in the uh, omega model. Okay, at the same time, they fulfill our droppability requirement. For example, these targets can be accessible by the small molecules, then they already have some such known structure and, and then they belong to a druggable family. That is uh, very important. At the same time, we can further to narrow down or to run this target based on our preference. For, for example, let's see if I think that expression is the most important and then I can immediately sort by the expressions or if I think the interactive community or even the pathway is relatively more important and then I can solve by the pathway. So it is a very flexible tool. So this is the approach, how we can find the high confidence target as well as the novelty targets for a couple of age associated disease and those non-age -associated, non associated disease. Okay. So now I will come back to a slide presentations. Okay, yes. Okay, so after we use the pandemic platform, identified the top 100 targets for each of the disease. And then we gathered the high confidence targets with different novelty, for example, high confidence, uh, medium novelty, and highly novel targets. And then we will just prioritize them based on the occurrence, as well as the average ranking across multiple disease. And then we gather the top 100 for each of the novelty targets, and then we do the hallmark assessment to find the high confidence, medium novel and novelty targets, and then we allocate them into our target view based on different uh, hallmarks of aging. At the same time, we also need to do the expression analysis to make sure the targets we selected, they uh, have a consistent 
dysregulation directions in a couple of diseases. And finally, we select the target. Okay, here is the examples of uh, the high performance targets we, 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 we find in the 14 age associated disease. As we can see, some of the targets, they are commonly chosen by the system. For example, this is CAPES-3, BGGFA, something like that, they appear in all the age associated disease targets. Okay. And then here we just give uh, very detailed information for the target's performance according to each of the disease. Okay. And also we separate them into different disease classes, for example, the neurologicals, metabolic, inflammatory, and also the fibrotic disease classes. Okay, so from here we can see how well the targets in each of the uh, disease area. Okay, and then now we just do a Venn diagram and then we can find which target is specific to the age associated disease and some are for the non age associated disease and some common targets. And then, then <coughs> sorry, and then we apply the same for the medium novel targets as well as the highly novel targets. Okay, and finally, we gather a list of uh, 145 targets that is of a very good performance overall, and then we allocate them into this target wheel. So a very important figure in your, uh, our paper is yes, because in summarize the highly co high confidence targets, as well as the medium um, and highly novel targets based on their drugability as well. Okay, so from here, let's say um, if I want to develop some drugs for focus on repurposing, and then I can choose the high confidence targets. For example, let's say we can find something that is, let's say, choose an inhibitors, okay, to, in, to, to restore the target's dysregulated expression patterns in a particular disease, okay. And then for the novel targets, it is very good to do the, let's say, the validation studies, and then, um, to design a, a new molecule for that part uh, <clears throat> to speed up the drug development. Okay, so this is the main idea. And also from here, we can see that there are some targets that involve in many of the hormones of, of aging, for example, the mTOR, CERT1, IGF1, and also the AKT1, they in most of the of aging. Okay, so it is probably due to their, their involvement in a lot of the aging or non-aging pathways. Okay. And so far with you, we found that the information is the mo most important as a, a factor of the hormone of aging because it has the highest number of the aging target we selected. And then next, we also do the expression analysis uh, for all the targets we find in four different age associated disease targets because uh, we want to find some target that is the consistent dysregulated in one direction in most of the disease classes. Okay. Based on that, we can further to do the pathway enrichment analysis with all those uh, 145 AI derived targets. And then we find that uh, they are relatively for, uh, fine in some of the very well-known aging pathway, for example, the FOXO, PI3KAKT, and also the MAP signaling pathway. And finally, we map these targets, the target we find into these, the, age associated a signaling pathway here. Yes, as we can see, pandemic can find many of them. Okay. And lastly, based on the hallmark of aging assessment and the expression analysis, as well as the safety assessment, we finally propose a list of the potential dual purpose targets. That is in this table. Okay. Altogether, we propose the nine targets with their upregulated or downregulated in each of the disease classes with a very detailed yeah, role in aging, okay? And more important, um, as we can see from this clinical trial status, okay? I think, uh, for example, the high confidence targets, most of them has been completed in phase of, um, four and also phase three. For these targets, maybe we can uh, 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 use it as a drug repurposing, but as, at the same time, as we can see, there are many targets that do not have any, any clinical trials reporters. So uh, they are relatively novel. Yeah, so we can, yeah, do further experiments to validate them and then you know, to speed up the drug development process. Okay, this is the main idea. And then finally, we suggest for genes that across different disease classes. The reason we select them because they have a significant difference in all of the disease expression comparisons. And also there is a significant 
difference between their expression for all those uh, age associated disease and non age associated disease, disease. At the same time, they fulfill our durability requirement. So that's we think they are the very good candidates. Okay, so I think this is the main idea of our paper. So yeah, I think that's it. So hopefully um, we hope this approach can really speed up our research in aging and finding the dual purpose targets can really benefit not only the people have a particular disease, but, <laughs> but the overall aging population as well. Thank you. What could bring this tool to the next level? Well, if you are talking about the future of this paper, uh, the most important aspect is, of course, uh, experimental validation. So um, in humans. And the way to approach it is to test those targets in certain age-associated disease, uh, disease models. So we, we, with this paper, we provide a pathway for a possible clinical development of interventions that are associated, that are implicated in uh, uh, age-associated diseases and aging itself, right? So for aging, as you know, it's very difficult to test or develop targets in a way that they make them commercially tractable. And you could possibly take some of those targets, test them in age-associated diseases, disease models, see if they work. If they do, uh, if you take them further, you could possibly repurpose them later on uh, for aging as well. I don't think that um, significantly extending lifespans of animals using drugs that target those, that, that work on those targets would uh, provide a huge proof of concept for um, further clinical development uh, in, in humans for aging. It's just animals do not age in the same way we do. So there are of course many, many common mechanisms, but uh, it's just uh, uh, they, they die of, uh, of, of, of usually Different, different causes, right? And uh, we uh, don't have the same diseases, right? So you don't see a lot of mice developing Alzheimer's um, or Parkinson's or other diseases uh, in that uh, uh, you know, age-associated disease category. They just don't live so long, uh, don't accumulate uh, the damage in the same way, uh, don't um, uh, cope with this damage in the same way. So. That is why I think it's extremely important to focus on those longevity therapeutics that are commercially tractable, that are uh, that have the potential to work on a human disease. Um, and once they are in the market, you would be able to uh, uh, try them for aging, also in humans, because the best model for human aging is a human. And um, I think that right now we, we need to learn from some of the drugs uh, that are out there like metformin and rapamycin uh, and a few others that are implicated in age-associated diseases that are implicated in aging. But since those drugs have been on the market for a very long time, they are not exactly commercially tractable right now. So nobody would want to develop rapamycin for uh, an age-associated disease because it's an old drug, it's off patent, uh, the patent life is not there anymore. Um, and it's very well known. Uh, so for repurposing, what we provide here is potential novelty, right? So you spend five, five, 10 years developing and marketing, and then you still have another 10 years of patent life, patent protection that will uh, enable you to recover the costs if you are successful. So yes, it's basically we're talking about 10, 20 year horizons, <laughs> but I hope that some of those targets will be both commercially tractable and useful in aging. Just like ropamycin, imagine that you have uh, commercial rights to ropamycin while it's still on patent. Boom, you of course can purpose it towards multiple diseases. You can fundraise for that. You can do more trials. You could start selling that uh, drug in a variety of diseases. You will start getting biomarker data from real patients. Uh, you would be able to implicate it in the, in, in the disease. Currently, it's very difficult because again, it's off patent. So those aging targets provide you with uh, a pathway for 
possible clinical development and uh, commercialization of, of those drugs in aging and age-associated disease. But again, the next step would be to test them in annual models and establish uh, the body of evidence that the system that we've developed can hunt for promising targets in age-associated diseases. And here again, we've implicated them in aging as well and structured them by hallmarks of aging. So we hope that will help the community to develop the promising field of longevity pharmacology. Many of those targets might be able to, to be purposed in a way that it would be picked up by a biomarker, by an uh, aging biomarker, of course, uh, not epigenetic biomarker, because epigenetic biomarker is uh, probably be good for epigenetic drug, but or epigenetics targeting drugs. For, for, for some of the more um, precise, broader biomarkers, you would be able to see the difference between before and after treatment. So we are also working on an additional tool that will allow you to develop biomarkers that will pick up the effects of those drugs that are targeting those promising targets. And finally, I think that right now we're just scratching the surface of longevity pharmacology, because even if you look at trypamycin today, it's actually, you don't know how to take it. We don't know how to properly administer it for, for aging or for age associated diseases. Do you take it once a day? Do you take it once a week? Which dose do you want to take? What kind of effects are you getting, are you achieving when you are taking five mg a week, one, once a week? What, what kind of effects are you achieving if you are taking it five mg a day? How does it affect the overall body function? Are you, are, are you getting any benefit? Are you getting worse? Are you getting any toxicity? So even though that's one of the most popular drugs in oncology and in uh, several other diseases, in organ transplantation, it has 20 years of history. We still don't understand how to use it. So it shows you the complexity of pharmacology in general. Those uh, targets that we've published is just the first step in a very long journey, because even if you implicate them in a disease, even if you implicated them in aging, you then will need to still have a protocol for administration and tracking, and that's going to be difficult. That's going to be a big journey. That makes sense. Obviously, making identifying drugs uh, and getting them to market is an immense task. Did you guys find in your, in this current paper that the data sources were adequate enough? Well, to answer this question, uh, you need to look at the different data types that were used for this, uh, for, for this study. So of course, uh, we used uh, publicly available data. Uh, here, um, we also used uh, models that were trained on massive amounts of uh, publicly available and so private data. Uh, so the models there are uh, trained on massive amounts of, uh, uh, of, of data that very often is not available for uh, public consumption. Uh, and um, many of those models would perform uh, well on data that is reasonably noisy. So even if you have a lot of inconsistencies, like some samples are bad, the system will... Uh, Will, will facilitate for, for that. So you would still be able to get uh, adequate results. In some cases, of course, if the entire data set is crap, you are not gonna get great targets. And for that, we do have quality control systems that enable you to evaluate the quality of the data. We even have uh, the scores that score, that, that rank the scientists associated with the study uh, and the trustworthiness of this data. Uh, and finally, since we are, uh, so since to nominate a target for, um, for this list that we've published, uh, you need to have many different pockets of evidence uh, to align. So the transcriptomic scores need to tell you that, uh, um, you know, it's a promising target implicated in this disease. There needs to be text-based scores, uh, commercial tractability scores, drugability, drugability scores. Um, when we are talking about omics approaches, there are many, many different scores. Uh, so when, when, when they align, uh, it gives you much more confidence that the target is real. 
And of course, uh, some of those targets may have challenges, right? And you would see that, and some of that, that would come from data, uh, from that bad quality data. Uh, but usually when you're taking 10 or 15, it's not that many for, for validation. So you can actually use uh, already existing chemical matter to, to very cheaply test those, uh, or, reasonably cheaply uh, start the um, drug discovery process to get uh, you know tool compounds some very promising hits to be able to validate those targets usually in a in a program uh, in the drug discovery program you're not starting with a single target you you're, you're starting with a list uh, and the failure rate there is like 95 percent anyway so here you should have uh, in theory, higher probability of success at the target discovery stage. That makes sense. And I think, Frank, you showed some uh, in one of your results graphics that you guys were re able to recapitulate um, kind of using your data, your approach, uh, some of known aging targets or systems that we've already known about inflammation, uh, rapamycin, I think, uh, mTOR was there for sure. Yeah. All yeah. Right. yeah, I think ultimately the proof is in the pudding. And if you're able to uh, recapitulate those things, that's, that's all that matters, right? One other question about just the approach. I think on this paper in particular, you focused on age, aging and age-related diseases, but I suppose that the the concept, the tool of panda omics itself can still be used for cancer drug discovery or any other disease specific discovery. That's correct. That's yeah, correct. So exactly. most of the uh, um, partners that we work with, so right now panda omics is actually a very broadly used platform. So a lot of people are using it, mm -hmm. uh, including academics, uh, uh, mostly smaller biotechnology companies that are still doing research of course, uh, uh, a lot of big pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I would say 80% of the take uh, the uh, cancer samples, I uh, can take the norms and uh, uh, very quickly do the uh, norm to disease uh, analysis. Uh, and you don't need to be working with uh, the tissues that are very remote from where the disease happens or um, it's usually not a systemic effect that you're looking at. Um, for many diseases, uh, you really need to for, for first formulate the hypothesis of where it's come coming from and then start doing the analysis. Uh, but the omics allows you to also work with text data quite efficiently, right? So it incorporates a lot of different text data sets and also provides you with additional hypotheses coming from those uh, um, uh, non-trivial hypothesis coming from those text data sets. Um, so even if you if your omics data set is wrong, uh, the text-based scores can still pull out good targets. Here's a fun question. Why, why the name Panda Omics? Well, we have an algorithm uh, that we've developed a long, long time ago. Uh, it's called iPanda. Uh, so it's uh, in silico pathway activation uh, uh, network decom decomposition algorithm. Uh, and it just stuck, right? And uh, I just like the animal a lot. So it's, uh, it's one of those animals that is super, super uh, benign and uh, uh, never, never harmful. So we, we like Panda. And, just extended the algorithm name to, to the product name. Perfect. Love it. Both of you are in a unique position, so I want to ask this question. Certainly other industry groups don't really publish that much or um, are a little bit more secretive. In this paper, I saw the main targets listed and with extensive uh, description. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just curious if there's a message that you could s send to other companies uh, assuring them that they're not going to lose their IP. What steps can they take to kind of be good stewards of it with, in, within the scientific community, but still be, uh, you know, 
profitable, et cetera? Sure. So I think that it's extremely important to publish, right? Because you've seen that companies that are secretive are very often associated with, you know, bad stories. Uh, you've seen those uh, stories with Theranos. You've seen those stories with many others. You actually have seen those stories even with some of the very promising, successful longevity companies, right? Uh, that if they had a little bit more peer review and uh, transparency, other people could step in and help them correct their path. So they would not fail and would not uh, you know, impact the industry uh, so badly. Uh, so what we, uh, what we started doing from the very beginning is that we came from the academia, right? And we need to, uh, we, we, we decided that uh, we will publish whatever is possible uh, in the most transparent uh, way possible. Uh, and it actually helped. So investors, for example, when you are talking to them, uh, if you want to deliver a point across and they have questions and usually they bring key opinion leaders, you can give them a paper. And if there are questioning target discovery capabilities, right, you can give them a paper or, you know, 50 papers saying that, okay, well, here is how it evolved, right? Here is, uh, uh, here is the thinking, here is what worked and here is what didn't work. And they actually like it because at the end of the day, expert investors, they're also uh, academics, right? So they, they, they also have some academic background. Uh, I think that it's extremely important for uh, companies to publish because uh, those publications they help uh, they help even investors and uh, uh, regulators to trace uh, your progress because those uh, companies that all operate in this field uh, they very often play a very long game. So we are here for you know a couple decades or longer and. Very often you have to pivot. Very often you have to press, uh, you know, put the, the pedal to the metal. Uh, and um, on some programs, you need to accelerate or choose uh, some of the more promising uh, programs. And those publications, uh, they, they remain, right? And uh, if you pivot, uh, people can still learn and understand whether they should go into this uh, or, or not, right? So you're also providing a service to a community. Uh, so I think that transparency is important. Uh, it's important to have very collaborative network of partners uh, that also like to publish and uh, uh, ensure that academics are always involved because very often, what I see in our field in AI powered drug discovery or in AI in general, innovation is actually not driven by the academics. So you see that some of the academic institutions in some areas are like two, three, four years behind. So it's just uh, not possible for them to have um, such a sophisticated uh, purpose built team that is not out there to do a paper, it's out there to really solve a problem because that's what you uh, need to do when you are an, uh, a commercial company. You need to be able to sell and solve. Um, and very often the innovation that happens uh, when you try to solve a problem uh, for real, um, it's, not, uh, it's, 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 go it's not gonna be visible uh, if the company doesn't publish. So it's important to publish the proof of concept so that even the academics could uh, uh, get a little bit better line of sight uh, into where to put their efforts. Very nice to talk with you, as always, very inspiring. Uh, appreciate your time. We already lost Frank Poon, so thank him for his time as well. Um, so uh, until next time, good luck with everything. Perfect, thanks so much. Great that aging started doing those video series. It's, uh, uh, it's very nice.